Welcome to day three of our Ambassador Climate Action Training. Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, very excited to see the agenda uh, that uh, you guys have prepared for today. I think there's going to be some some really interesting topics covered. So these are important issues. You've got some some great speakers uh, lined up, um, and uh, I'm excited for you guys that you're going to be able to do uh, a deep dive uh, and and learn some some interesting stuff. Um, so happy learning and and welcome to this this training session. And really what I want to talk about is how uh, vulnerable the Canadian food system actually is and how climate change, food insecurity and COVID-19 have exposed further our vulnerabilities. Now, the other thing, unfortunately, that we've forgotten is that food is actually a public good. I mean, what are the three biological requirements for survival of most organisms, including humans? Food, air and water. Air and water, we basically treat as public goods. We don't always treat them well. And uh, it isn't always the case that you don't have to reach into your, uh, into your wallet or your purse to, to um, acquire air and water. But by and large, they're still public goods, whereas food is fundamentally now a private sector system. So you definitely have to grab some money for most of us because most of us no longer self-provision. You definitely have to get some money in order to access a, a nourishing diet. As I mentioned, food insecurity in Canada is a big part of this story. Uh, one in eight Canadians were thought to be food insecure, at least when you define it in terms of income. Uh, and if, you, if you think of food insecurity in a larger sense, then pretty much all Canadians are in food insecure because of these vulnerabilities I'm talking about. But in income terms, one in eight were reporting they didn't have enough income and resources to acquire a nourishing diet. The other disturbing piece of all this is, is, it, is what's been exposed around this notion of essential. So governments made a number of decisions about who could stay open and who couldn't. And really what they did was focus on the dominant system, on the supermarkets and the pharmacies. And food access then was compromised outside of those dominant systems. We lost in Toronto, we lost a lot of the public markets and many other communities as well. We lost the public markets. Uh, it took a long time to get the community gardens back open. Uh, school food programs were closed. This, there's lots of closures in the shelter system. Uh, some community food projects had to try and pivot to direct delivery, which was much more expensive. And really what happened through this process of determining what was essential is that the inequities in the system were reinforced, especially for indigenous racialized low-income communities. And breaking bread together and mental health appears also have been compromised. Of course, you know, we use food as a way of, of being together and sharing and uh, obviously not being together. And, and a lot of these challenges around accessing food uh, have had significant impacts on mental health, it appears. Canada already has a major food waste problem. Somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of what starts out on a farm never gets to your mouth. But this is a, an atrocious level of waste and really speaks to the inefficiencies in the system. And it got worse during COVID. Milk, mushrooms, greenhouse production, flowers, fish, packaged goods were all reported to be uh, wasted because they couldn't get the, the food moving through the supply chains. So really now we're in a situation where the very structure of our farming processes, the, very, the way we use land, the, the way we put animals on the landscape, uh, the way we fertilize uh, for food production, all these things are now major contributors to GHG emissions, methane, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide. And basically it means a fundamental rethink of the way we do farming, but it also of course brings more into play the idea that this division, division we've had in, in, in the last number of decades between what goes on in rural areas for food production and what happens in cities has to be shifted. In other words, we need to turn cities back into food production places and in ways, of course, that minimize GHG emissions. Basically, we have to be building sustainable food production, whether rural or urban. And particularly, we need to look at what are called transition supports for sustainable farmers. In other words, a farmer who's in the process of converting to more climate friendly, more sustainable, more resilient farming systems, the first few years of that transition, are they are super vulnerable. And so many countries around the world, particularly in Europe, use transition payments to help with that process. 
we have to work hard at integrating the food and healthcare systems. We, we still have a food system and a healthcare system that operate as if food and health aren't really connected. And we've got to change that. I don't know how many people realize how much potential and power there could be in St. Jamestown, given that we have people from all over the world. Um, we have a very large percentage of people with post-secondary degrees, lots and lots of experience from around the world. And it's important to note that we have a lot of people who've come from um, other parts of the world because of climate change. So we have a high level of awareness about the issues of climate change. It's something we often call actually climate chaos because we know that it's the unpredictability and uncertainty that have driven a lot of our um, focus on solutions. You know, we have about double the population of people of African descent. We have a larger proportion of people of indigenous descent. So we are a very special, unique, precious neighborhood with a lot of problems, but also a lot of strengths. We ask people if they'd be interested in having affordable, sustainable access to food from local farms and from farms in the global south, because we know many of the people who live in our community are indeed from the global south. So we have to adjust. Um, the kind of food supply to take into account those needs. And as we can see, a very large majority said yes to that. So the Oasis Food Hub, you know, has been a collective, um, a collective process of dialoguing about the challenges, the issues, the assets, the possibilities. And we came up with, you know, these goals for a food hub model that we want to see emerge from St. Jamestown. So we want to improve health and food security, obviously, but also to create sustainable jobs and social enterprise opportunities for the many talented and experienced people in the neighborhood. We think it's a great opportunity to provide community and accredited education programs because as we innovate and shift our entire food system and try to adapt to climate change, it's going to take a lot of active participatory education. And our main functions, obviously, for the OASIS model are growing and production. And in this case, we are working with farmers and we have two acres of our own farmland that we are beginning to learn how to do sustainable farming on. We've been doing bulk food buying for a couple of years now and we're expanding that program as we work together to support um, bulk purchasing directly from suppliers to uh, make affordable, healthy, organic ingredients available. The city has done a lot of great work on the kinds of policies that should be driving our food system. There's a lots of great um, lots of great principles, lots of great ideas. If you can see the existing food system is kind of weak, but if you look at a model food system, it would prioritize health and environment. It would um, be more than just about eating. It would also be um, for community. It would you know, make sure that prices allow for farmers and producers to have a decent livelihood while at the same time allowing for consumers and families to have more healthy choices. To sum up, really our food hub, you know, looks at engaging every um, phase of the food cycle. We're trying to make sure that it's affordable, accessible, and appropriate, a la the human right to food. We are run by and for the community and we use a human rights framework to ensure inclusivity, non-discrimination, to ensure that all the diverse different kinds of people in the community are able to be to benefit from it, but also able to make decisions and be a part of decisions that affect them. And a huge focus for us, particularly now as we can see more and more impacts around heat waves and the like, is to make sure that we can help our community to become climate and pandemic resilient. We're in a housing crisis. There was a period in time in which we built an extraordinary amount of it. Um, and we, we have to we, we have to hold on to it ensure that it has another hundred years, that it's the best place to live as possible, and think, how can we build more? That's the real challenge ahead of us. So we've been looking at this from the perspective of really digging into where did this housing come from and how is it so fundamental um, to ca uh, Canadian cities? And what is the way that we can give these, um, uh, these buildings another hundred years? Uh, we worked uh, across the city um, and uh, and elsewhere outside of Toronto and a lot of work, uh, for instance, with Toronto Community Housing, who's really um, emerged as, as a leader to really say, let's look at our housing stock and how do we renew it? How do we uh, give it that second life? And targeting a, a series of neighborhoods in Scarborough and elsewhere uh, to bring in new amenities. Um, uh, this is a sports court we built um, uh, with actually MLSE, with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment as part of their grant program on a, a Toronto Community Housing site, which was really a 
bottom-up community design process, uh, which was fantastic. It's just opened. Um, Toronto Community Housing is actually a beneficiary. Rich received a billion dollars of funding. Um, so from this $15.8 billion, they received $1 billion to be able to, in earnest, uh, really tackle the state of repair of the existing housing stock um, and to, uh, to take a few projects and make them best in class. And so we, we have a bit of an ulterior motive here. Wouldn't it be great if the, the TCH buildings in St. Jamestown uh, could be a beneficiary of, of some of that funding? And what, I think what's really important to say and is really core to our work is that there's a lot of talk about green buildings uh, and, and, and lower energy, and that's phenomenal. It's, it's a critical pillar. Um, but we also want to make sure that that's balanced or that there's a co-objective really of comfort first uh, and resilience first. And where you really get a project that sings is where it's about improved comfort, improved health, uh, improve resilience and reduce GHGs and we really and reduce energy. And we find that those things really come together. It, in a lot of the older 1960s and 70s buildings, um, uh, you know, the front doors were very residential style. Here we're looking at making a new frontage onto the street, bringing in new amenities, let's say new doctor's offices uh, or other kinds of services uh, to support and animate that streetscape. So part of the work is really about bringing new services to the site. And most, I think this is probably the most unusual for a building of this type, is that we added 10 inches of new insulation to the outside envelope and triple glazed windows, meaning that this building has a massive winter coat, uh, which keeps it warm uh, in the winter and cool in the summer um, with all kinds of interior shading and, and cooling measures to really make sure that people are not overheating. It's important to us that this building performs well, but let's not let's make sure we're not adding more carbon back into the into the building stock. And actually, what we found is that retrofitting this building in this way, as compared to tearing it down and building a new high performance building, actually, uh, it, you, you know, there's 200 years of worth of carbon savings in in that. Overheating is a massive issue in these buildings, but the comfort solutions are actually quite complex. And so what we did here, next slide, is actually model uh, 2050 temperatures, which we know are getting hotter and hotter and more and more humid, to say, are people going to be comfortable today, but are they also going to be comfortable in 2050 um, to make sure that we're designing for the future? One of the outcomes of this of this retrofit is actually that uh, not only is there lots of carbon savings in terms of and energy savings, but there's also a resilience element here. So what this slide shows is that if uh, power were lost to the building and the heating system went out on the coldest day in February, um, a building built to the standard of the building code within four hours would get so cold that people would have to be evacuated. But this building, because it's built to this in incredibly high standard, um, much higher than the building code, is actually people could stay in place for four days before it got so cold they had to leave. What that means is that, you know, if there are extreme events, uh, this allows people to stay in their home. There, there really is a critical opportunity to make sure that some of the inequities that were really found during COVID around sheltering in place are addressed and that we don't just build new, that we retrofit what we have and that we do it in the best way possible. Uh, so in order to do that, and part of this, we developed a field guide to retrofits and occupied buildings. Uh, and some of the partners that we brought on for that uh, it was supported by CMHC. One was ACORN to, to work with residents cross country to do a whole series of workshops and surveys to really get a, a resident voice around people who've lived through retrofits. Um, what are people's concerns? What went well? What didn't go well? And then we also partnered with industry groups. So contractors, uh, people who do this work. And what we found is that how do we find commonality between someone entering your home uh, and and yourself. So the idea that if someone's coming into my home, uh, I have interest, they have interest, they want it to run smooth, they don't want delays, they want it to be easy, I want it to be easy, I want it to be smooth, I want it to be frictionless. And so how do we get there? And that was the real, um, uh, the real purpose of the work. But virtually every single building in St. Jamestown is a of the vintage and level of um, upgrades that has been done there where they are very appropriate for a tower renewal conversation. Mitigation reduces the greenhouse gases so that we can have a better future. Adaptation recognizes that we are living with heat waves, 30 degree plus days, et cetera, et cetera, right now. What can we do to adapt to this changing climate situation? At a specific time, um, so that they get to zero by 2050, 
uh, we are going to be add, adding emission performance requirements on buildings of a certain vintage. Uh, additionally, they'll be requiring uh, audits and for energy and emissions, and also requiring tune-ups um, that um, require that people do some mandatory upgrades to their building. And uh, electrification pairs really well with deep energy retrofits that are looking at uh, the entire building as a system, and, and Graham and Yale described this quite nicely. Um, from our perspective, we're looking, we consider a deep retrofit anything that is targeting emissions reductions of 40% or more, um, and with the emphasis on or more. Um, but in retrofits can be done, you know, at once. Uh, and that was the case, I think, for most of the, the examples that Graham and Yale discussed. Um, or they can be done in a stepwise fashion over multiple years, depending on uh, on building owner budget and um, the, the condition of the systems in the building. And both of those approaches are just fine. You know, we've done quite a few retrofits at this point, and that was the first one of the first projects where <laughs> residents were super excited about uh, having a retrofit done and even having people working in their space because they knew they were going to have uh, cooling incorporated uh, into the project. And which was just, it was great from a retrofit standpoint um, to really have that enthusiasm from the residents uh, it was wonderful. And when we talk about deep retrofits, uh, we talk about kind of like the, the public or social benefits and, and some of the private benefits. And when we're talking about public benefits here, we're talking about the increase and uh, increasing resilience uh, for buildings, which is obviously becoming more important as we're seeing real time uh, the climate change. Um, uh, obviously, the carbon reductions is a key and very important public benefit. Uh, there's the economic aspect and specifically talking about, you know, green, local green jobs, good paying local green jobs. Um, and in our work, we really try to incorporate social procurement as well uh, to really try to make sure, um, if possible, uh, we're providing job opportunities for, for people facing barriers. And in many case, in cases, we've had people who are working on the project who are from the communities where we're doing the work from CMHC, uh, the, from FCM, there's a lot of funding available right now, especially for um, social housing buildings and, and also market development efforts that are gonna bring down the cost of this of the retrofit work. Um, but just to put the impact of the, the carbon price to, into perspective, this graph just shows kind of where we are today, where uh, carbon price is $40 a ton, um, which really equates to uh, an impact of eight cents uh, a cubic meter of, of gas, basically. So it's a, a small impact on the price of gas today. But by 2030, uh, that impact is going to be, um, uh, it's going to double, basically double the price of gas. So it's like a 30 cent, um, almost 35 cents increase in the price of gas. So doubling the price of gas from where it is today, that will definitely have an impact on the decisions that building owners are making in terms of what kind of equipment that they install. Um, and in our own analysis, we found that it's about $150 a ton is the price that we need uh, for uh, an air source, electric air source heat pump to be less expensive to operate than an efficient gas system. Uh, and it won't be long before we're there. I want to talk about engagement um, practices or things that TAF has basically done um, when working with residents. And the first one might seem pretty obvious, but it's actually, you know, providing really good door to door notices um, with consistent branding. Um, we want to eliminate any sort of surprises for residents when they're going through this process and we want to be respectful of their time. We want to make sure that we're giving them information up front um, that's really clear and easy to understand and consistent branding just helps build trust so that they know where this information is coming from. It's about this specific retrofit project. As we all know, St. James Town is the largest high-rise community and the most densely populated neighborhood in Canada. It is also a high turnover community where newcomers to Canada make up a large portion of the population and most of them reside in high-rise buildings. In total, there are 19 high-rise buildings and a population of about 18,000. Uh, in our presentation, we will be focusing on seniors as they are often uh, quite neglected and require much uh, needed care and attention. The average household uh, spends more than $2,000 a year uh, on energy bills. Uh, nearly half of the energy used in your home uh, goes to heating and cooling costs. So making a smart decision about your home's heating, ventilation, 
and air conditioning system and lighting can have a big uh, effect on your utility bills and improve your overall count, count, uh, comfort uh, at home and help fight uh, global war. So the solutions have to be by installing solar panels and replacing all of all the appliances with energy star and LED lights. Make insulations for walls and windows and doors. Use uh, energy efficient HVAC systems and uh, use LED lights and sensors to save uh, energy. Also, replacing the heating and ventilating ventilation systems uh, use high efficiency elevators one of the uh, long-term benefits we uh, like to think that management would be uh, considering is the adding the property value to the um, building itself you know me give, giving it more desirability for uh, people to continue living there. It kind of, uh, you know, gives a higher rating to the community in general, um, which in turn gives more, um, the more eyes on the place, uh, the more funding you might be able to find, for example. Um, lowering the monthly bills and overall maintenance costs is another uh, big one. Um, if you have new things, and everything is running smoothly, obviously it's gonna bring down the cost of maintenance considerably, which should be a good incentive for building management, et cetera. And then you would also be able to avoid any penalties or taxes that might be um, implemented later on because if this continued problem doesn't get solved, obviously they're gonna to have to take steeper means of you know, um, dealing with the, the issue. And nobody likes to get more taxes, right? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to the presentation on the emergency preparedness project, uh, which is prepared by uh, Julia, Justin, Petra, uh, Vicky, myself, and Vinusha. Uh, what we found is like uh, for the emergency preparedness, uh, the managing companies, especially, they have kept some of the uh, limited flyers uh, with uh, only in English language. That means it wasn't like this. Uh, these flyers were were not easily uh, to be. Uh, the, all the people who are who are not native to English language, uh, they are having the problem with with this sort of the flyers, and they are coordinating with the uh, uh, fire service of the Toronto to prepare these flyers as well. And there are other uh, uh, these are the pictures that have that we found within the, our Saint James Town community residence. Uh, to eliminate these communication barriers, uh, uh, by uh, what we can do is by developing a multilingual, accessible digital information hub, uh, as well as uh, localized physical spaces where we can. Uh, provide those uh, uh, emergency related uh, information emergency related materials and uh, designing the childhood education programs on the issue that would allow to create a more resilient community in the future to be prepared for the next emergency arises our future vision that we re we recognize and pr presently are proposing and addressing will fill these gaps so creating educational programming for youth and residents, creating a common space for people during emergencies, accurate, consistent, concise information available, retrofitting buildings and units, community gardens, balcony gardens, and farmers markets, and multilingual um, information available. The rise, and that is basically the envisioned the future we envision will incorporate all these changes. As a group, we have compiled four personas of vulnerable peoples within St. Jamestown. This includes a caregiver, a senior citizen, an immigrant student, and a child. We will be focusing on the caregiver. Angela Simone is a 37-year-old mother to her three children aged 3, 6, and 10, and is a single parent. As a parent, Angela wants her kids' living space to be safe, warm, and secure for them to grow up. Our solution is a combination of few things, um, creating localized physical spaces in the buildings to be used as emergency storage and for facilitating the emergency-related training. 
organizing uh, for a formation of resident crews, which is actually recommended by the City of Toronto's uh, Emergency Preparedness Guidelines. Um, a creation of digital hub that provides accessible and multilingual information that includes um, real-time updates in case of an actual emergency and a childhood education program focused on emergency preparedness. The, the bulk of uh, the cost that we imagine is um, to, I guess, design and um, construct these uh, resiliency rooms in each, um, each uh, I guess, high-rise building in St. James Town, and, and um, these rooms uh, we imagine would include like um, emergency power, um, lighting, heating, cooling, food, water, and medical supplies. My persona is Danielle, a 43-year-old single mom. Um, she has two children who are school-aged um, and one who just started ninth grade. Um, she lives in a high-rise building outside of St. James Town in the West End of Toronto. Um, she works part-time now um, due to COVID, which is more like casual part-time, and she homeschools her three children. Um, so uh, childcare has been an issue for her. And one of the uh, key things that she said um, is though climate change in, is important, it's hard to think about it regularly when I'm stressing about providing the bare basics on a meager income. So uh, let me move forward by stating the problem based on personas such as uh, the ones that Priscilla and uh, Michelle has spoken about. Uh, and the problem that we found was that there was bias, bias against credentials and foreign work experience of newly arrived immigrants. And, uh, and this is very predominant, a very predominant problem in St. James Town, and it leads to unemployment, underemployment, and causes depression and ill-nourished families. Action is needed if the community has to, uh, if this community has to focus their attention on climate change. Without the basics being uh, taken care of, people cannot think of something beyond the basics, uh, as per what as Abraham Maslow speaks about uh, of his theory of hierarchies. Uh, so what are the solutions that we thought of uh, when this is the problem about their credentials and about a foreign work experience not being uh, there being a bias about them and causing therefore unemployment, underemployment, depression and ill nourishment in families. The solutions. So we thought of the main thing of uh, what was important was upskilling foreign work experience of immigrant workforce in uh, St. James Town. Greater connectedness and cohesiveness in the community is one of the values that will, will be derived from the solutions. Community self-reliance, because people will depend on the skills that they have gained. A handy task force in the community to address community problems. Uh, reduced personal and family stress and increased family income. There's like, uh, you said it already, but there's a high level of uh you know, people with post-secondary degrees that are underemployed. So there is this natural drive and passion that comes from wanting to put your knowledge and skill sets to use. Um, so that's an um, advantage. And just really, um, I think also the maturity that comes from people who are a little bit more mature, or I mean older, with more life experience, who are even parents, there's a different um, contribution that they have to the work market. Um, so I think when you're looking at the more older population um, or more mature population, not seniors, but those who are still in that um, working age group of say 35 to 55, okay. there is this untapped unfair advantage with high school sets. Yeah, increasing the number of people um, who complete courses, free courses online, and I plugged in some light from Coursera, um, from Founder, even the World Bank offers some really great free courses to upgrade your skills, your knowledge, and your um, experience. Excellent. Uh, and the channels, how we will reach up our, our uh, personas. So community organizations, podcasts, notices at the local store, announcements at uh, religious gatherings, website, community festivals and gatherings which are held often, health centers, word of mouth, uh, 
online call to action on websites, surveys. When we're talking about uh, workforce development and employment, uh, especially in uh, an area like St. Jamestown, you know, this is a place where you have over in, overqualified people that are underemployed, right? There is a lot of really, really smart, capable, willing and available people that can do great contributions to Canada that are unable to do so. So providing some level of workforce development is not just a nice to have, it's actually we're losing, Canada's losing out, everybody's losing out on this particular situation. What's the on the ground reality today? So let's take the four areas that you talked about. You talked about, you know, a cooling system, you talked about food, you talked about workforce development. And some of the things you talked about were in, in inclusion, diversity, affordability, connectivity, and so on. So what are some of the things that your project focuses on? And, some, and what are some of those characteristics? But once you have that in mind and, and going to the next stage, what are some of the strategies required to bring that to life? And what are some of the resources that you need to jumpstart that solution as a project or a number of projects? It could be people, it could be skills, um, mentoring and so on and funding. Let's put our resources together. And in there, we will also be including and inviting people from different sectors inside and outside of St. Jamestown. So it's by and with St. Jamestown residents, people who work there and other providers who work there from, from the city and also from industry. Well, last thing is mentoring. And then there's two different kinds of mentoring. There is for your team, project mentoring. So for the, and I'm gonna try and get it right. We've got um, uh, the cooling spot, the refuge centers or the emergency rooms. We've got the workforce development team and we have the energy saving upgrades in the apartments. All of those teams can ask for a mentor in any specific area, whether it's technical, financial, project management, et cetera, et cetera. And then as, um, as the last team uh, identified, there's obviously a great opportunity to uh, provide some workforce development. And so for each uh, and every ambassador, if you so choose, um, you can ask to have some personal mentoring for professional development. Thank you very much, ambassadors. As you can see in the regulatory policies, in the advice from the architects, in the information from TAP, uh, in the advice given by Rod McRae and uh, Josephine today, all of the work and the ideas that you've identified, all of those projects um, are at a critical juncture right now. And it's a critical juncture because there's an opportunity to capture some of those demonstration type um, uh, funds, resources, attention, and bring uh, St. Jamestown into that future state that we all are looking for. So uh, hopefully you will be able to join us on this uh, journey forward, and I will look forward to seeing you guys in the near future. It is my privilege to close the ambassador training section of the Community Climate Action Project in St. Jamestown. First, I would like to thank our speakers and presenters. You made the issues come to life for us. The organizer, a special thanks to Kirk, Yasmin, Kim, and the whole team. Your dedication made it happen. And finally, and most importantly, thank you to ambassadors who took a leap of faith with our process and dedicated yourselves to doing a great job in a very short time. Congratulations to all of you. In a way, this is just the end of the beginning. We plan to continue the work with Ambassador Projects and see the ideas realized in the community. Emergency preparedness, cool rooms, support for those seeking jobs, and tower renewal. The next steps will be mentorship for both projects and ambassadors as individuals. Ambassadors and their mentors will work together to realize their projects in the community. Thank you. I want to say congrats. I look forward to one day meeting you all in person. Hopefully that happens soon. Thanks very much. Congrats to you, everybody. Thank you.